All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, in the midst of the, the sort of Kai season when, when the department is emptied out. Uh, I am really, really excited to welcome Liz Lawley here. Uh, I, Liz is one of the first people I met in the game studies community back when I was a baby master's student. Uh, we played World of Warcraft together. I, I joined a group called Terra Nova, uh, a guild that was founded by, among others, Kurt Squire and Constant Steinkohler, who are now here. Um, and we had many, many hours of raiding excitement. Uh, I played a, a warlock named Muriel. Liz played a priest named Galatea. And, and collectively, we brought fear and terror into the boots and the hearts of the Alliance. Uh, and we actually just rewatched a, a video of, of ourselves uh, killing Alliance leaders that we have recorded from, from that era. And so uh, it, the, this experience, for me at least, speaks to the ways in which our experiences in games and virtual worlds build connections that reach far beyond. Uh, the time that we spend in these environments. Uh, the time that I spent with, with Liz and World of Warcraft has aided me immensely, especially when I started wanting to position myself within an academic conversation around games. Uh, and, and the work that Liz has done uh, has been incredibly beneficial to many of us as we try to navigate uh, this growing discipline. I mean, in particular, Liz's current work has been reaching beyond the borders of the US uh, to establish a game design program uh, in Croatia as part of the Fulbright program. And so she will be speaking about today. I'm really excited to see what you've been doing. So at, on that note, I'm going to turn this over to Liz uh, and let her uh, take it away. Okay, thanks. So, hi. Um, so he gave you some background, right? You know, the untenured faculty and graduate students don't get a lot of opportunities to be powerful, right? So, so wow was a great thing for us. We got to kill things um, <laughs> with with no negative professional consequences, uh, <laughs> and uh, I have very many happy memories of that. And I was talking with the grad students about the level of sort of professional connections that came out of that because on any given night playing the game. There would be the playing of the game, and there would be the meta conversation of game scholars who can't help but criticize the content of the games uh, and the, the narrative and the structure. And then there would be the personal stuff that, you know, always ended up impinging. And it built really strong connections, really strong personal connections, and then really strong professional networks. Um, so, a um, little background on me. Uh, I am a professor in the Interactive Games and Media program at RIT. I run the Lab for Social Computing in the uh, Magic Center at RIT. The Magic Center is Media, Arts, Games, Interaction, and Creativity. No, we are not using the C twice, um, which is one of my pet peeves in, in acronyms. The C in Magic does not stand for center. Uh, so, uh, and Magic is an interdisciplinary center and a publishing studio, so we've got both a research center and an LLC so that we can publish our students and faculty's games and, and have an industry presence in that way. Um, I have, you know, I was an accidental game studies person. I actually didn't see myself as a game scholar in any way. I was working in an information technology department. My interest was in social computing and social interactions. And when one of my former students created our games program, he said, you should come and be in this, and I was like, but I'm not a gamer. And he said, I seem to recall that you have notebooks in your basement mapping out on graph paper every level of the great underground empire of Zork. I was like, yeah. <laughs> he said, that makes you a gamer, uh, it turns out. You know, and because, you know, I was thinking console games, right? Killing things, you know, Twitch gaming, and I had no interest in that. Um, and I think this often happens when we talk to people about game studies, right? Like they have a very narrow media-fueled view of what constitutes games. Um, and I will talk to people all the time who say, oh, I don't play games. And I say, no poker? No. Well, poker, yeah. <laughs> it's not, well, I guess it is a game, right? You know, so you get this, this conversation going on. Um, so my background isn't in gaming. My PhD is in library and information science. Uh, and uh, so, but here I am teaching game design and making games and, you know, engaging with game scholars. So, so that's the background. Um, in terms of the stuff I'm doing right now with games and tourism, 
Um, it sort of started back in 2010 when our university president, as university presidents tend to do, gave us an entirely unfunded mandate to do something with the newspaper. And, you know, they called us in, you know, the newspaper publisher for the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle and our president, and they said, let's talk about ideas for how we could work together. And I was a little more naive at that point, and so I tossed out all kinds of great ideas, including an alternate reality game that we could, you know, use to get people to explore the city. And they said, great, let's do that. And I was like, like now? And I was like, yeah. It's just like, well, where's our budget? So you don't need a budget. You, you'll be fine. You know, use your students. Yeah, uh, it'll it'll all work out great. Um, so, um, so we did it, uh, and it was um, one of the most difficult and uh, draining things I've ever done. But it ended up being remarkably successful and in a lot of ways ahead of its time. So, what we built was a seven-week game that was intended to get people to explore and engage with the city, the history of the city, the culture of the city. Um, turns out Rochester has an amazingly rich cultural history, which many people don't know, including those of us who've lived there for a long time. So we built this seven-week thing, and it, it was transmedia, even though that wasn't really a word back then. Uh, it had components that were in the newspaper, had con components that were on the web, and it had components that were embedded in the world around us. Uh, you know, signs that were in windows that you had to know to look for, um, things like that. And uh, local challenges that included creative stuff for people to do, scavenger hunts based on mobile phones, which was a pretty new thing at the time, uh, and, uh, and then a bunch of casual games that we built on the web. So creative challenges were things like a photo contest. And because we were working with the newspaper, the newspaper could give us a lot of expertise and assets. So the photo editors judged our photo contest. We were terrified when we did this because we were doing something that most people had never heard of before, an alternate reality game, um, in a city that isn't a super, you know, it's not San Francisco folks in Rochester. It's a very different kind of environment. We had no idea if anybody was actually going to play this. Uh, and we ended up with over 500 photos submitted for this first uh, creative contest where we, we gave people a list of things that had been invented in Rochester, um, a lot of which I was really surprised by. Um, so the first franchised business ever was in Rochester, started by a woman. It was a hair salon. Before that, hairstylists all went to people's houses. You didn't go to the salon. So not only did she franchise the first business, she invented the reclining shampoo chair, right? You know, things you didn't know. I mean, everybody knows Kodak is Rochester. You know, that was an easy one. But Ray-Bans, French's mustard, the first internal combustion engine, which was not properly patented in time to be able to actually uh, make any of the profits from it. And so we asked people to take these photos and we got amazing images mm -hmm. back, right? Like the kind of, you know, I have so many of these, it's always so hard to pick one to show. Um, so that's the grave in uh, Mount Hope Cemetery, which is also where Frederick Douglass, who I hear is doing amazing things, <laughs> uh, is married. And uh, Susan B. Anthony, uh, her grave is there as well. Um, George Selden invented the internal combustion engine, but didn't properly patent it. Um, and these are two RIT students wearing Ray-Ban sunglasses, holding a Gannett newspaper, because Gannett was founded in Rochester, and sitting by the grave. Um, I suspect they would not have known many of these things about Rochester had we not challenged them with this stuff. So we, we had a number of these kinds of things. We had a bunch of, um, as I said, mobile phone based scavenger hunts where you would be told a starting point for that week. And all of these were thematic. So there was a Rochester Firsts week, there was an Arts and Crafts week, there was a Food and Drink in Rochester week. Um, we put them in a particular place. And what we found, you know, there are a lot of people in Rochester who don't actually live in Rochester, right? There's a huge suburban community. The city itself, there's an enormous amount of poverty and there's a lot of fear um, from people who live in the suburban areas of going into the city. The city is scary, right? You know, turns out many parts of the city are not scary, but people have this 
scary feeling. So they wouldn't want to go. So we tried to make it so it wasn't so open-ended, right? Like we're going to give you places to go that are interesting. So we'd start them in a particular place like this historic bridge and they'd send a text to uh, or use a smartphone app to send, you know, get the first clue and it would take them on a walking tour of key sites in the area. Uh, and it was really lovely. We would release these on Saturday morning and, you know, we would go out and look and we would see lots and lots of people walking around like this, right? And we complain about this, right? You know, people are walking around, they're looking at their phones. This was awesome that they were looking at their phones. And so we had things like, you know, go out the back door of the Eastman house. Across the street, there is a statue of an animal. What kind of animal? To answer the question. Well, you can do that by just knowing that there are horses all over Rochester from this horses on parade thing. But then the next question says, on the base, in, on the north side of the base, there is a quote from a woman. What's her last name? Right? You're not going to get that one off the internet. Right? You actually have to go to the horse and look at it. Right? So we had people you know, exploring and doing this. And that was really um, a, a very successful component of it. Um, we also had these web games with stuff related to the city, and this is where we worked um, again a lot with the newspaper, and they gave us archive photos related to the particular topic, uh, and worked with us on, on ideas. So, you know, on Mondays we would have jigsaws, on Wednesdays we would have this mapping game. What the mapping game worked is uh, we'd put up a map of the city, and then we would flash names of particularly well-known spots, when in this case, Nick Tahoe Huts, which is the home, if you've ever been to Rochester, of the garbage plate, which is our sort of culinary specialty. It tells you a lot about Rochester. <laughs> uh, but uh, we'd flash it up and we'd say, click on the map where you think this place is. The closer you were, the more points you would get. Yeah? And we would let you play it as many times as you wanted to get a higher score. Um, which meant by the end of the seven weeks, many people had a better sense of, the, of where things in Rochester were in relation to other things. Um, the way the game worked in terms of a scoring standpoint um, was twofold. Individual people gained points for every single puzzle that they created over the course of the seven weeks. And what we said is at the end of the seven weeks, the top 50 people will get invited to a gala party that we will hold uh, at RIT's campus. And, um, but this was an alternate reality game and it had a storyline. And the storyline was that Rochester for 100 years has been controlled by a secret society. Uh, and this secret society has lost its leader, and now there are factions that are fighting for control of the society. And each of the factions was allied with a particular charity in Rochester. So one of them was connected to the Children's Hospital, one to the Food Bank, and one was connected to uh, an organization that worked with low-income single-parent families. When you joined the game, you picked a faction. And every point that you earned also went into your factions total. And that reset every week. We went to a local foundation and we said, if you give us $50,000, we will give all of that money to these three charities. Um, and they liked that idea. Um, everybody won on that one because they gave the gift to RIT, so we got to count it as a gift to RIT. We gave the gifts to the other places. Um, you know, all of this was good without any of it coming out of my non-existent budget. Um, <laughs> and what we did is we reset that every week. Um, so every week we said the top gaining faction is going to get this much money, the second level will get this, the third level will get this, then it resets. Because the problem with the seven week game is if somebody finds out about it in week two, they're screwed. Right? They can't win because somebody else has a full week's head start in points and there's no way for them to gain those back. With the weekly reset, A, people would participate because they really cared about the charity. Right? And they could do just the parts that they liked. They could do some web games and be done with it. Um, so uh, we also, it turns out there are three New York Times crossword puzzle developers who live in Rochester. So we recruited them to make crosswords specific. So these were all custom made for our content. 
and they did it to be nice because we had no money. Um, so this was a total stone soup project, right? Um, but it worked, and uh, we ended up with over 2,000 registered users. Uh, but when we did surveys after that, we did some pretty in-depth surveying of players and we found out that the majority of those 2,000 accounts were actually couples or families. Um, so in fact, we were probably looking at more like four to 5,000 players um, that were represented by those 2,000. Uh, and I am going to... Um, so we did something really self-serving at the end which is our last creative challenge was we asked our players to do a three minute video of how they had pictured the impossible as a part of this game, which became a really lovely way to, you know, talk about what we had done and share it. I've got a whole playlist of these on um, YouTube, some of which are just unbelievably emotional for me to watch because we had people who said, I don't leave the house because of my social anxiety, but I really wanted to finish these puzzles. So I went and met with people in coffee shops so that I could, you know, get our faction to have more points. Right? Um, we had, you know, mothers saying, I never thought my kid would actually want to engage in an activity with me again, but he was so excited about this game that we did it together. And this is actually one of my favorites. My name is Jack Yu, and I live in Brighton with my wife, Cappy. Our kids, Justin, age nine, Carissa, age seven, and Joshua, age two. Between work and church, and in and out of the house a lot. Kathy takes care of our kids at home full time and is constantly on the move. It's surprising how many activities the kids already have at such a young age. Between school, sports, music lessons, and church activities. Joshua spends a lot of time with me in the car while I'm driving the older two kids around. I think we're pretty typical for an American family with young children. Um, lots going on, you know, we're busy, and uh, oftentimes it feels like we don't have a lot of time for each other. I saw the story about Picture the Impossible in the newspaper, and we all thought it looked like fun. We chose the tree faction because when Justin was one year old, he had an operation at the Galisano Children's Hospital. We thought the doctors were great, and so we just thought that this was a way that we could get back. We didn't plan it this way, but as we got into the game, different members of the family just naturally started taking responsibility <coughs> for different parts of it. Jack takes the lead on the newspaper puzzles, I take the lead on the local challenges, and Justin handles all of the web puzzles except for the hardest ones. It's the first thing Justin does when he gets up in the morning. He goes straight to the computer and does the puzzles. Then he reads the forms and reads about what the other players are doing. We're always running into other ATI players on the scavenger hunts. And as soon as Justin finds out their username, um, he can rattle off all these facts about their Facebook profiles, and their um, achievements, and what they've written about themselves. <coughs> he'll be like, sorry, our son really isn't stalking you. He knows this about all of the ATI players. <laughs> Of course, we all go on scavenger hunts, and uh, Carissa and Joshua like to help us find things and help things, and they really enjoy exploring new places, and they certainly make our group pictures more interesting. Picture the Impossible has given our family something that we can work on together as a team. We've enjoyed exploring parts of Rochester that we've never been to before, and we've learned so much about our community. Playing this game has really brought our family together and really given us something that we can all get excited about. I like Picture Thing possibly because of the online games and I like to play them. And I like to go on the scavenger hunts. I like Picture Thing possible because we get to go on walks together. I love Picture possible. this game when it's over. Yeah, we haven't done a next one yet. <laughs> so um, we didn't script any of that, but I mean, I couldn't have scripted a better 
description of what really worked about this and how it engaged people and how it engaged people at different levels and uh, how the, the tie-in to the giving back to the community helped bring people in, but the engagement with the activities is what kept them there. A lot of game design lessons in all of this. Um, so we ended that. And uh, I told my chair not to ever, ever, ever ask me to do anything like that again. Um, and so. he gave me a year. Um, and then, you know, you know how you feel right after you t turned in all the paperwork for a grant that you're applying for? Like there's that. Yeah, you, there's a thing you do when you're kids where you hold somebody's arms down and they try to push their arms up, right? And then you let go and their arms kind of float up. So it feels like that when you hit a deadline and you turn that stuff in. And I was in such a good mood and Andy came into my office and said, so I've got this idea. Right? Um, <laughs> and, you know, he found that one chink in my armor and all of a sudden I had a new project. Um, and this project is something called Just Press Play, which we've written a lot about. Um, and it was to create an achievement layer for our undergraduate students. And really what it was, was we said, we know that our most successful students are not the A students always. Some of them are A students, but some of them are B students or even C students, but then they go on and they do really amazing stuff, right? What do we know about these students? And can we reverse engineer them and find a way to get more students to engage in the kinds of activities outside of the classroom that we know our most successful students engage in? Yeah. Can we take what we know about retention and increase retention with students uh, through a playful engagement that makes them want to do these things, rather than us saying, you should really do these things, right? which is then just another piece of work that we are assigning to them. Um, and so that's what Just Put Play set out to be. And, and we divided what we wanted them to do into you know, creative activities, learning activities, exploration, and socialization. Um, and the explore part is really the relevant part for me at this point because this is sort of what's leading into what I'm doing now with games and tourism. Uh, but we had a variety of different kinds of activities that people could engage in uh, that, and, and they sort of build a profile that says, and anybody who knows me is not going to be surprised by the distribution of points in my profile there in that socialize is kind of outsized, right? Because um, I'm always going to go for the social activity. But we're trying to get people to also sort of say, can I look at myself, you know, and can I look at other people and make that sort of an aspirational thing of I want to do the stuff that they're doing, engage in the way that they engage in. We learned a lot from this. Um, you know, depending on what kind of mood I'm in, I can tell you all the things we did right yeah, or all the things we did wrong. And there are lots in both of those categories. Um, I was talking with the grad students at lunch. Um, you know, we did a paper for GLS for the Hall of Failure series that GLS used to have. Um, and that was really fun to do. But one of the things I said to the students is, you know what? Hall of Failure is a luxury that only tenured faculty get to indulge in. Right? Um, because, like it or not, academia doesn't tend to practice what they preach on how we learn from failures and, you know, finding a failed hypothesis is every bit as valuable as, as, as finding a successful one. Um, but we did write that because we were tenured, um, and there's a bunch of stuff out there on what we did what right and wrong. But for me, all of this was sort of leading me towards how do we use games to explore better? How do we engage people in the way that we did with Picture the Impossible? Um, and so I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about my aha moments in putting these two fields together. And the first one starts with me spending a quarter, back when RIT still did quarters, in Dubrovnik, Croatia, where RIT has a campus. Uh, and not everybody knows where Dubrovnik is. Um, you know, that picture on the left, that's Dubrovnik. Uh, it, it, is, um, it is sometimes referred to as the Pearl of the Adriatic. If you watch Game of Thrones, it's where they film King's Landing. Um, it is a UNESCO heritage site. Uh, UNESCO heritage site. It's beautiful. Um, and at the end of the Homeland War, when everybody's view of the former Yugoslavia was a war-torn wasteland, RIT was actually smart enough to go out there and say, "We'll build a campus here." 
Um, so we have an RIT campus in Dubrovnik. By campus, I mean building. Um, and it is both a Croatian accredited university and an RIT campus. And we've been teaching both a hospitality and tourism degree there, and then also for the past 10 years, an IT degree. So I went out for a quarter and taught some IT classes, mostly as like a teaching vacation. It was a really easy way to not have to take leave, but still go someplace interesting. And I fell in love with Dubrovnik. And I also started noticing some things that connected it in a meaningful way for me to what I was doing professionally. <laughs> so this is the picture that my 16-year-old son took while we were walking the walls of the city. And he posted this to Facebook. Um, and I saw him doing this and I thought, huh, game students should come here. Yeah, this is, and, and I started really thinking, not just about the tie-in to the game, because you can use that for marketing, um, but also about what game students could get out of living in a place like this, right? And we know how much space influences the way we think you know, the way we create. Uh, RIT, if you've never seen pictures of it, it is a brutalist brick architecture. I mean, it is all bricks and squared off lines and modern structures, a little bit of glass thrown in, but it's nothing like being in a 900 year old medieval town and where there are no straight lines, right? And there are no even surfaces. And you think differently about texture and you think differently about history, you think differently about space. So, you know, how do you think differently about level design when you've lived in a place where you have to go up and down and around instead of just around the straight edges? It's a lot easier to design with clean polygons, right? But it's a lot less interesting too. So, so I started thinking about that aspect. And um, at the end of the trip, I told my son that we could spend 10 days in any European country that he wanted. We could pick one because I wasn't going to try to do Europe in 10 days. Uh, and he picked, unsurprisingly, Italy. Um, he was really into Assassin's Creed II at the time. And he mapped out an itinerary for us that involved going to Rome, Florence, San Gimignano. We went to Trento because I gave a talk in Trento, which allowed me to write the trip off, so that was good. Uh, and then down to Venice and to Forli. Uh, and all of these being places. Every single place we went, he knew more about the history and culture of that location than I did. And I said to him, you know, and I did this for your, I, I did when you did your, um, your massively online course thing, um, I told this story, right, about, you know, going into the, you know, the various museums in Florence and Alex knowing these stories, he's going, how do you know this? And I said, is this all in the game? because I hadn't played Assassin's Creed, it's not really my thing. Um, and he said, well, some of it's in the game, but I got really interested in it in the game, and so then I went out and I read more about it. And I was like, oh, this is so <laughs> awesome. Like, you know, I don't script these things, I really don't. These all actually happen. So this is Alex um, on the Piazza Michelangelo um, listening to the Assassin's Creed soundtrack on <laughs> headphones <laughs> while he watches the sunset over the Duomo. Um, that was a good day, really, I have to say. Um, but that's not actually, and, and when I started looking into games and tourism, I actually found this article from 2009 in the New York Times where they said, whatever the Italian Tourism Board is paying <laughs> Ubisoft for making this game, it's not enough, right? <laughs> so, um, but here was the real aha moment for me in this, which is when we went to San Gimignano, uh, San Gimignano is very similar to Dubrovnik in that it's a old pedestrian, walled city, you know, and here's the thing in Dubrovnik. I would sit on the main drag, the Stradun, and I would drink my coffee, and I would watch the, you know, on a busy day, they'll get 10,000 cruise ship tourists a day, a day, okay? amazing natural laboratory because those people get back on the boat and they leave and you get 10,000 new tourists the next day. Right? Um, you don't get to do that in Rochester if you're doing tourism <laughs> research. So, um, 
<laughs> but what would happen is they'd get off the boat and you'd have these families, yeah, and they'd walk down this main drag of the old town and they'd get some ice cream, they'd buy a t-shirt, the kids would clearly be bored out of their minds. Um, they'd get down to the end, they'd take some pictures and they'd go back to the boat. That was it. And they would miss 90% of what was interesting and cool in town, which, you know, this is a pathing problem, right? How do you get people to do side quests? How do you get them to talk to the NPCs? Gamers know things about this, right? And I thought, we could help them. Yeah, not only could the game students gain something from being here, but the hospitality people could gain something from what we know about exploration and engagement and all of these things. So, so I had already been thinking about this, and we get to San Gimignano, and they have these, this game that you can buy when you first walk in, and it also includes an activity book. That's this thing right here. And the activity book, has stuff in it for kids that says stuff like, can you find the place in town where you can see seven of the 14 towers at once? Yeah. Here are six different kinds of doorways that you can find in San Gimignano. Check them off when you find them. It's like, there you go, right? Like this, that's what I'm talking about. Um, how do you engage kids? And I would see kids walking around doing this, you know, with um, which we didn't see in Dubrovnik. So this, you know, this was a big, yeah, yeah there's the, you know, can you, and at the end, of course, there's some silly little trinket that the kid can get for turning in their book and showing that they've checked these various things off. Um, so, so I started looking around to say, well, surely people must be doing this already, right? This is such an obvious connection, using the power of games and engagement to get people to explore. And the answer is, yeah, kind of. Um, you know, I found this publication um, in the tourism space, uh, not peer reviewed, it's an industry publication, with some good examples, small examples. Um, and I found a lot of stuff in the games literature about cultural heritage games, right? There are people who are doing work in this space to say, how can you create serious games, which is a phrase I have always hated, always, you know? I mean, how can we suck as much of the fun as possible out of it, right? Let's make it really serious. No fun here. This is a serious game. Um, so yeah, there's tons of serious game stuff on cultural heritage, and most of these are really tiny little implementations some of them were successful, some of them not, but they're test beds, right? They're not something that you could go play now. It's, it's a research experiment that somebody ran. And in almost no cases do the things that were done by games people involve anybody who knows anything about tourism and hospitality. Right? It's games people making games. And sometimes it's tourism people making games. But never is it games people and tourism people working together with what they know about their respective fields. I thought, huh, I see an opportunity. Um, so I'm not going to show you, this is a couple of different games that were out there and there are videos, but I'm not going to play them right now. Um, so I started digging around. Like, there's got to be better examples of this. There's got to be stuff out there. And, you know, now we have stuff like this, right? You know, Pokemon Go, except not so successful, it turns out. You know, the tourism people jumped on this really fast within weeks of Pokemon Go coming out, you know? But then, yeah, I mean, there was no there there to, the, to that phenomenon. Um, and again, it's people working completely independently. Um, no input from the tourism people to what might have made Pokemon Go better. Um, there are a lot of us who played the precursor, Ingress, who have a lot to say about how it changed our interaction with places, how it changed our understanding. I was telling the students today that I lived in Rochester for 20 years. Only when I started playing Ingress did I start to have a really good spatial understanding of where things were in relation to other things. Uh, because I have less and less and less of that with each passing year as I use my phone to direct me places. I'm not looking at a map. I'm not looking at where things are in relation to each other. Ingress forced me to zoom out. It forced me to think about spatial relationships. Right? Nobody used that. You know, to, to learn from that and say, how can we, you know, move this over to a new environment? Um, and so at the end of the day, almost every tourism game out there has failed. 
No, they just they they're not sustainable. Uh, they are they don't work. Either people don't engage in them enough, or people engage in them too much, and there's not money to be able to support it. So it collapses under its own weight. Um, so I mean, I actually have a whole list. You know, there's the people can't figure out how to monetize it. This is a big problem. It's not that it can't be done. It's just they're not always thinking about it the right way. So. When we did picture the impossible, I had these unbelievably frustrating conversations with the advertising people for the newspaper. And I would say to them, so we're going to do this coffee shop crawl where people are going to go to coffee shops in different neighborhoods around the city. Why don't you go to the coffee shops and see if they'll advertise in the paper? And they would say, why would we do that? <laughs> <I'd> say, <coughs> It's hard to have these conversations. Yeah, I, I would say, well, you know, because we are encouraging people to go to those places, they might want to like put coupons in so people do more than just stand outside. I say, well, those people don't advertise in the newspaper. <laughs> Right, so um, maybe there's an opportunity, but no, they were having none of this. If we were not getting more advertising from the people that they already got advertising from, they just didn't see a uh, there there. And so one of the reasons that Picture the Impossible didn't monetize is because they didn't want to, right? They didn't <coughs> want to think outside of the way, and we weren't in a position to send salespeople out to sell advertising. Like, they had the infrastructure, but not the interest. Um, so that kind of problem happens a lot. Um, a lot of these cultural heritage <coughs> and tourism games are just so boring, <laughs> right? You know, um, I've got students this semester who are working on building a, an augmented reality game for a place near us called uh, Genesee Country Village and Museum. If you've ever been to like um, Old Sturbridge Village or uh, Colonial Williamsburg, it's this kind of recreation village. And um, it's a kind of a cool place and they've got really neat stuff out there. Um, and so I went out there with my students and they've got these things on the, the buildings with a number where they say like we've got this cell phone and mobile phone tour and you can dial this up. Oh my God, it was so awful. It, it is somebody droning on about the architecture and you know, you're walking around this really cool place and it's a beautiful day and you're like, why would I listen to this? There is nothing fun about this at all, nothing engaging. And so people make this stuff and they're like, we can't understand why people won't play it. Um, we used to joke with our graduate students that we should have a crash cart for when we did games testing uh, every week so that if a game was awful, we could like come in and we'd wear like clown noses and we'd have the crash card and we'd be like, somebody bring this thing back to life, it's dead. Um, but there, yeah, there's a lot of boredom. And then they're hard to run. Yeah, there's, it's just, there's a lot of work in developing them and there's a lot of work in managing it. Um, and a lot of times it's games people trying to manage these large-scale hospitality activities that hospitality people actually know how to do that. They know how to work with groups of people and how to properly organize and herd and charge and all of these things which games people don't know how to do. Um, so with all of that, I said, so what am I going to do with this, right? Yeah, I, it's clearly something interesting. Um, what can I do with it? And it's, it, you know, what I'm doing with it is twofold. So the first is what I'm doing it with it from a teaching standpoint. Uh, and uh, it turns out that stuff I was saying about how game students really need to do this, okay, all students really need to do this. Um, all the research on study abroad shows that it has extraordinary positive effects. When I was out there the first time in Dubrovnik, my older son was actually there for study abroad. It was very awkward because um, when I was planning to go, I hadn't told him. He was a sophomore in computer science. And you know, I, uh, he comes to me one day and he says, my friends and I are going to do this really cool study abroad thing in Dubrovnik because the computer <laughs> science program ran a thing out there. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, yeah, and I say, okay, look, 
I have to tell you this now, um, and oh you may want to rethink what semester you want to <laughs> do this. Um, you know, because can you imagine? You know, study abroad, oh, big adventure, fly yeah. five thousand miles across the country, get off the plane. Hey, mom! <laughs> um, you know, I just couldn't imagine that he would want to do it. But he was fine with it. He was like, "You're not going to like follow me around to the bars, are you?" I was like, "No." Um, he said, "Well, that's fine. You know, it'd be kind of nice to have you there." I was like, Oh, you're so sweet. Um, so, so he was out there too, but I got to see something that almost no parent ever gets to see, which is many of us get to see our kid come back after a study abroad experience and see the change in them, see the growth. Right? Very few of us get to watch it happen in real time. Right? That was an amazing gift to see that and see him grow into the culture and learn how to navigate things. You know, the day that they didn't quite understand measurement and numbers in Croatian and ended up with 10 pounds of squid instead of one pound of squid, you know, um, and then had to figure out what to do with that for the next three weeks. Um, that, was, that was fun to watch. Um, but it really is a powerful experience for them. Um, and for game students in particular, there are some big issues around localization. Um, you know, beyond the stuff I was talking about from creative standpoints, because there's a lot about creativity and travel, and especially immersive travel, where you do more than just visit places. I thought I fixed that. Um, that is not supposed to auto advance. I copied and pasted it out of another. Uh, so I'm just going to skip to that, and hopefully this one won't auto advance. Um, so. They need to understand game design in other cultural contexts. They need to understand that humor doesn't translate very well, it turns out, from one country to another. What we find funny is not necessarily what people you know, somewhere else are going to find funny. What we see as very violent may or may not be seen as very violent or too violent or not at all violent in another country. Um, there are no real study abroad opportunities for game design students. Um, I mean, there are opportunities, but not to study game design in another country. They can study computer science and web design and language and literature and history and architecture and all kinds of awesome things, but they can't study game design. I looked. Um, it, and there are universities with game design programs that offer study abroad opportunities, but you can't take the game design classes because those fill up with the local students. Right? If somebody comes to RIT as a study abroad student, they can't get into our game design classes. We can barely get our students into our game design classes. So there's a gap. There's an opportunity. Uh, and we happen to have this conveniently located campus in Dubrovnik, Croatia. Uh, so I went to the Fulbright people and said, I think we could do something really interesting with game design education in Croatia, where there's a growing indie game development community, where the Croatian students could really benefit from this, but where we could have some real cultural exchange by also bringing students from other countries to study with the Croatian students. And much to my amazement, they agreed. Um, I, it never in a million years occurred to me that they would say yes to this sort of insane proposal. Um, Constance's letter, I'm sure, did not hurt <laughs> in that, that process. Um, and so I went off and I built a bunch of classes. And then I came back and I said to my students, why don't you do this? Um, that picture is taken from the parking lot just above <laughs> RIT's building um, with a phone. Right? Like, there's nothing fancy going on with this photography. It just looks like that. That's, that, that is, in fact, what it looks like. Um, and so I've been talking to my students. Um, you know, I do this presentation where I say to them, you know, these are RIT students. Not an RIT student. Um, <coughs> But it's a pretty compelling value proposition, right? You get all the advantages of study abroad. You are taking classes in English. You are taking classes in your area of interest. So we're doing classes on games and tourism, a seminar, but also a production studio where they build a game about Dubrovnik that's in, in embedded. And I'm working really closely with our tourism faculty there so that we get both perspectives, so that they get people from the industry coming and talking to them about 
tourist behavior. What happens? You know, what do tourists think about? What do they do? Um, you know, so one of the reasons I'm here is because I want your study abroad people to call my study abroad people because apparently faculty are not supposed to be involved in this process. We have to let the grown-ups do this, you know, the <laughs> ones who have lawyers and risk management uh, <laughs> comparison things. And so um, I think this has some potential for collaboration and I'm just going to leave that there. Um, <laughs> Here's the other thing, is that um, in addition to teaching, one of the things I found is that there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the tourism literature. Now, those of you who have done interdisciplinary research know how hard it is, especially if you've been in one field for a long time, to jump into a new field and find the relevant literature and connection. Um, and it's a good thing, right? Because um, it forces us to think differently, but it's hard, right? I'm an expert in my field. It's hard for me to dive into a new field and feel entirely comfortable, even though I'm a librarian, so I'm pretty good at that whole literature search thing. Um, so I took a sabbatical last year to start doing a literature review. Um, and it's been a rabbit hole of a process because every time I think I've pinned down the relevant tourism and hospitality literature, I discover that in fact they use an entirely different term for something that I have been searching for for three weeks and now I've got to totally expand in a different direction. Um, but I have started to identify a bunch of like clear intersections in, you know, if you dig deep enough down through the citation trails, even though we're not citing each other's stuff, if you go two or three levels down, we are citing shared literature down at the bottom, you know? And so we, then as it comes up through our fields, the language changes, the way we talk about it changes. So it's not obvious if I do a search on, say, replayability, I am not going to see things about revisiting destinations, even though it turns out those two things have enormous amounts of similarity in the way we think about them. So motivation, you know, is an obvious one. You know, why do people go to Dubrovnik? Why do they go to Dubrovnik instead of going to Tuscany, right? Why did they pick one destination over another? Why did they go back to a destination, right? All of those things are motivation issues, and yeah, you know, you can actually find self-determination theory being cited by the hospitality and tourism people, just like you can from the people talking about games motivation. Um, user experience and service design, this is kind of interesting, these are pulled from a uh, user experience consultancy firm um, who have a really interesting blog where they have, they pull together research and articles and stuff and I, so out of curiosity I ran a search on tourism on their site and I thought Oh, this is interesting. These are concepts I have seen before in my field. You know, the, the user experience of engaging in something, service design concepts. Um, but even beyond that, storytelling and destination development. It's like, oh, these are familiar things. Yeah, these are, these are things I understand. Um, User-generated content, right? Um, there's a lot of discussion about user-generated content actually in both fields. For the most part, on the hospitality side, they don't use user-generated content. They use co-creation. Okay? Now, you can find co-creation also in the user experience literature, in the HCI literature, not really in the games literature. Right? We don't talk about co-creation very much. We talk about player-generated content, right? We all have our own words, but it turns out we're, we're talking about very similar kinds of activities. Um, Globalization is a huge issue in both fields right now. Um, yeah, these are some sc screenshots from the GDC vault about the various things that game companies are dealing with in terms of, you know, cultural differences and you know, design practice and you know, in the, uh, you know, on, on the tourism side, you have many of the same kinds of issues, you know, how does cultural identity affect your tourism and your decision to travel to, to further spaces, how does it change the way you market your destination when you're marketing to a broader audience. So, um, what I thought was going to be relatively easy to do during my semester-long sabbatical, which was just 
a literature review, right? How hard could that be? Has turned into this unbelievably convoluted process of pulling stuff together. I am hopeful that by the end of the summer I will have something meaningful that pulls these threads together, but this is, this is where I am right now, is hoping that we can start to, A, can start to get some cross-pollination in the literature, and also people collaborating more and recognizing that there's expertise in the other field that can help them, rather than, you know, creating parallel processes where there's very little drawing on each other's expertise or literature. Um, so um, if you have questions about this, if you want to know more about it, if you want to work with me on any of this, let me know. This is, you know, this is a fairly wide open area right now. There's not people working in the space, which is fun. Yeah? <coughs> I mean, I'm a point in my career where I can work on whatever I want. Um, the idea of working on something that I can write off every vacation that I take <laughs> is pretty attractive, I have to say. Um, yeah, and, and I'm not actually doing that um, exactly. Uh, but, <laughs> but it is an opportunity to go to interesting places and talk with people about how what I know can help them, um, how what we know can help them. And so I am inviting you to play in, in this space. And that's it. And I finished before 3 o'clock. Yes. So I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, we have about 10 minutes for questions. I, so I know your work, but this is the first time I've seen it pulled together since Fulbright and all of that. I think it's amazing. I have so many ideas. I was writing many of them down. I was thinking about, too, have you thought about what this might mean for not tourism destinations, but areas of, let's say, even the U.S. or, say, South L.A., that we, where you see, you know, uh, um, self-selection into aggregated groups with very little traffic between them. I'm thinking about sort of this sort of strategy mapped to the goal of something like um, making money, right? Or sort of revitalizing areas or pulling people into districts that they have. Yes. Um, yeah. So there. So what are your thoughts about that? It, it's in many ways, that's where this all started, right? That's what Picture the Impossible was meant to do. Yeah. Picture the Impossible was not a tourism game. It was not intended to bring yeah. people from outside of Rochester in. It was intended to get people to explore parts of the city that they had been afraid to set foot in before then, that they didn't understand, that they didn't know what was there. You know, we see the same thing with Ingress. You know, there's Ingress tourism, but, um, but more so, there's people exploring areas that they haven't been in before because if you want to build that triangle you know you've got to go to that neighborhood that you have never been to before you've got to find that statue that you didn't know was was in the city um, so there's a lot of this going places you wouldn't otherwise have gone it transfers into tourism as well so like when I went to when I was on the Fulbright and I went to Zagreb uh, which is we have also have a campus up there Zagreb is the capital of Croatia very different from Dubrovnik um, and I don't really know know much about Zagreb. It's a sort of weird city that ranges from Habsburg to Soviet era architecture. Wow. Um, and knowing where to go, it's hard. So I would use Ingress and I would find myself like in the courtyard of a Soviet block housing thing with the most amazing graffiti. And the graffiti was a portal in Ingress. Right? So this is how I end up, you know, in somebody's backyard, you know, claiming a portal in a place that I never would have explored to before. Um, so, so yes, I think, you know, Pokemon Go is doing, you know, sort of doing that now. It, it didn't have much of a half-life. Uh, but but I, think that, I think these kinds of games have enormous pen potential to do that. Um, I think there is more money right now in building for destination stuff because people, you know, we get back to that. How are we actually going to pay for this, right? You know, I've done enough unfunded mandates at this point. Um, and there's not a lot of money for urban revitalization stuff, and there's going to be significantly less of that um, moving forward. Um, but the thing is, that can be a really nice side benefit, right? You know, if I build something that's 
theoretically, to bring people to Rochester to explore the city because they didn't know that Frederick Douglass published the North Star there or that Susan B. Anthony's house is there or, or any of those things. That can have the benefit of also being playable and usable by people who are local. So I think that's almost going to have to be a second order effect because we just don't have the funding to be able to do it otherwise. Whereas, you know, we can go after the, the hospitality industry funding to, uh, to create the initial versions of this. At least that's my hope. So. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so um, a lot of the exploration aspects of the games that you are talking about um, have very specific places that players have to go to. Mm -hmm. um, so like for, for example, for Pokemon Go, you have Poker Stops where you have to go to specific areas and that's how players go and explore. But I feel as if that exploration is very, um, um, it's not exploration for the sake of just like exploring out the world, it's just exploration in terms of I have to go from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, just for ex an example, um, I was recently playing um, the latest uh, Zelda game, Breath of the Wild, and that game really, really encourages random exploration and through that I saw the mountain that was up there in real life and I was like you know what I'm gonna climb the mountain so how do we move from uh, going from just exploration that's very um, uh, restricted to exploration where you just literally explore like the real world because of uh, like games so this is not a problem that is unknown to game designers right? how do you get people to explore beyond the specific quest points Right, um, and first thing is you're not going to get everybody to do it. Not everybody wants to do that, right? Not a, you know if we if you know if if you look at the various models of MMO motivations, right? There are people who want to explore everything and see everything, and there are people who really don't. They just want to check stuff off on their list. And we're not necessarily going to change that inherent set of motivations of what somebody wants to do, but what we can do is create more opportunities for people who want to go beyond that. Um, yeah, the interesting thing about the places in Pokemon Go is they all come from Ingress. Right? And the places in Ingress all came from user-generated suggestions. Um, so there are, but, but that was where Ingress really broke down because they, they did not have the people to deal with the volume of suggestions that came in. So after the initial push, which was mostly a fairly narrow demographic of players who tended to congregate in very specific kinds of areas, they just got bogged down. They had a backlog of hundreds of thousands of locations that people never got a chance to go through and add. How you expand the spaces is a challenge, but it's a challenge that we actually have research around, right? Like we have research into how we deal with user-generated content and crowdsourcing. We have research into how we encourage players in a game to explore beyond the set path that's in there. You know, what I, I don't have the answers yet, but what I, you know, what I really believe at this point is that there's this fertile ground for cross-pollination in that regard, that those things that we know about HCI, that we know about user experience, that we know about gameplay uh, and game mechanics and motivation can be transferred into physical spaces and, and tourism so that we benefit on both sides. So, so that's not an answer, but it is a maybe overly optimistic view that that's a solvable problem. Well, and so I have the fantasy then, as far as that goes, like my daughter's fifth grade class, that they would take the history book, go into the game, add, you know, have that as a class assignment where the kids are, oh, this was at this location, and, you know, add the content right. so that you can look at any map and how your history book becomes ingress or, right. you know, it, and ways to encourage that kind of annotation is something that is a really interesting Does challenge. Does it seem possible? Yeah, <laughs> it's possible. It's hard. Um, have you? I don't know if you've touched base with the Eros folks in the last couple. Of years. I haven't. You know, I I know <laughs> what they're doing. I I'm yeah. looking at what they're doing. So um, Jim I have Matthews not did a nice one for Duluth. 
that I think was pretty successful, um, kind of a tourism game. And then as a related project, they built one for a, an exhibit from the, one of the Minnesota Minneapolis um, History Museum that involved quests that had to take you across the state. Mm-hmm. And they were able to track, I know they got some evidence of kids and people going to other museums and places they may not. I will, I will follow up, though. Yeah. Other questions? Well, it's three o'clock, so. So as is our custom, uh, if anybody else wishes to speak with Liz before we head downstairs, please hold your your questions until we are downstairs. Uh, Liz will be able to cut the line and and get to the (laughs) wine and cheese first. Not me. And then we'll head to (laughs) the mingle and snack. All right. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you all.